Let me uh, just first of all talk a little bit about um, what I kind of perspectives, but also a little bit about me. So I, I come from, you know, your world. So my, uh, most of my career has been spent in IT. Um, I ended up in IT a very strange route, which is uh, not being a particularly strong technologist. Did a very brief stint of programming in PL1, which dates me hugely. Um, wasn't very good at it either, by the way. Um, and then ended up through various twists and turns, having worked for compute the technology industry and then two big FMCG companies in PepsiCo and Coke in uh, Igloo Foods Group, which is now called Nomad, um, uh, by the way, which we've just bought on Monday by a new investment company, um, as Chief Operating Officer. And I currently and have for the last five years run all of the effectively cost in the organisation, so all the supply chain, all of the um, technical uh, functions and technology still reports to me, and I have a long-suffering CIO who puts up with that. Um, it's an interesting story in some ways, not glamorous or highly um, uh, technical or digital, but I guess what I would hope to do is, in the context of what Aid said, just talk about my perspectives over a reasonably long career of how change happens or doesn't happen in organisations. Um, and if any of you find yourselves in a position of piloting or leading change, maybe there's some wisdom or some perspectives as I look back on, on how some things that could help you with that. Um, briefly, uh, the story of Igloo Foods, it was part of the Unilever business back in the day, so bird's eye for those of you in the UK. Um, Igloo is actually the bird's eye equivalent in continental Europe and we have Findus brand in Italy. Um, it was a carve-out from Unilever and uh, bought by a private equity company back in the heady days at the end of 2006, where lots of private equity companies were making lots of big mon money on buying um, businesses and flipping them after a couple of years. Um, almost nine years later, our private equity investor, Premira, sold us um, on Monday to a uh, new investment group. Um, and they've got big plans for how they're going to build on our consolidation engine, as it were, as a food business and create a new food platform. So some very exciting times ahead for us and who knows what they look like. Um, I'm sure digital will hopefully play in that in some, in some form. But I do anticipate that as an organisation, we're going to have to transform ourselves in what is a very, very competitive world, very competitive. Um, during that sort of eight eight and a half years, um, there were lots of things that needed to be done. So the business wasn't fit for purpose. It couldn't operate on its own as a carve out from Unilever. We had to set a new infrastructure for systems mm. and processes. That was my job when I came in um, to join the business. You know, separate this thing in nine months if you can, please, and don't spend very much money. Um, it took slightly longer than the nine months, so 15 months, and I spent a huge amount of money. But anyway, they forgave, forgave me. Um, partly because actually having spent a huge amount of money to start from scratch, which was the, probably the most exciting, as an IT person, the most exciting opportunity you could ever get. So no rubbish to integrate or transform, just what do you want to do, how do you want to operate the, ris the business and build that. And it wasn't quite out of the box and plug it in, but it was as close, I think, as it gets to it. So a bit of a rare opportunity. We also got to reinvent business process across the business. Um, bizarrely, for Unilever businesses, they had never worked as one across, as one frozen food business. So uh, we got to invent, invent how um, everybody worked, and we got to put all of the core business processes in. So for a couple of years of my life, I had an absolute ball. Um, lots of hard work, took lots of risk, um, and just enjoyed for the probably the one and only time in my life as a CIO, being able to say to people, I don't care what you think, you just have to do it this way. <laughs> and how often do you get the opportunity to do that? So, um, because if you don't, you know, we won't be able to operate in, in a few months' time. Um, so that was the start of then a transformation, having got independence of rewiring the culture of the business taking lots of cost out, trying to transform the top line of the business, um, getting more into innovation, and just a whole bunch of things that came from that ability to operate independently. Um, so that's parts one and two of our story, very briefly, eight years, lots of grey hairs later. 
um, and part three, who knows? Let's see, let's see where it goes. Um, what I wanted to do then is focus on, so from all of that, and I guess all of the things that I've learned in my now far too long career, um, of which actually I think probably, if not all, certainly 80 plus percent of what I think I've learned, I've learned because I was sat in an IT role. I think you get a huge, or in my, maybe not in so much in the future, but I had a huge vantage point from seeing how business worked inside. And I often used to say to people, but I, I kind of know how it works inside out, as opposed to a lot of my commercial colleagues would watch the business from you know, a consumer or customer perspective, but wouldn't understand how the organization dynamics work. So there was a huge privilege in that, I felt, and it, it served me well. But you start with the kind of concept of change. And I think, or, Change is, it's a very natural process in the natural world. You know, forests burn down naturally because it allows for renewal. I think that metaphor is very relevant in business, actually, for a couple of reasons. I think businesses have to re you know, renew themselves, as we've just heard. Sometimes external things happen that knock you sideways and you have to respond to. Sometimes, and hopefully, you see your own opportunity. And as leaders in business, um, and leaders in IT, sometimes you have to create your own forest fire. You have to, horrible thing to say, light that match. Because um, if not, the, you know, the, an organization wouldn't actually galvanize itself to get to that change point. It's really difficult, I think, for people to vote for change. It's just too scary. So, you know, think about that. Lighting matches or striking matches to create a bit of a fire sometimes is a good way of creating the drama around a change. I had the unique opportunity of having my own fire because we didn't have anywhere to go. if We didn't create our new infrastructure, so there was no choice. Um, and that, but that's quite a rare situation. And we were able to create a massive burning platform around that, which served the business well culturally. I think the other thing to, that I've kind of referenced about change is often when you start off on a change journey, whatever triggers it, it might be you know, an M&A um, something or other, it might be just you know, McKinsey have come in and told the board that you, know, you need to do something very different. Whatever the trigger is, where you end up might often be quite different. And I think those leaders of change who are really good at change will be the ones who are very good at spotting those connections between things and actually whilst they may be equally very good at creating structure and governance that gets the change done, whilst they're getting everybody else to be very organized and do stuff, what they're actually spending a lot of their time on is kind of going, oh, actually, I didn't anticipate that, but you know, there's a nice little opportunity over there. Um, and you know, again, a small example from, from the reference that I just gave you, we, um, we set about creating a new infrastructure I hadn't appreciated when we started that, that the business culture was so out of line with what we were trying to do as a business that we were probably always going to struggle to turn around the business. So I might have got the infrastructure set up well and the new systems and processes, great, fine. But the people in the business had no concept of what it was going to be like living outside of a big corporate structure. And so midway through all of that transformation, we embarked upon um, a very extensive cultural change program. It sounds very kind of grand, but um, more on that later. And that actually was the thing that drove a lot of the then subsequent success, not the fact that we had the independence. So, you know, you can end up anywhere, I think, be, be open and be kind of uh, scan, horizon scanning all the time for those opportunities and making those connections. Change does go wrong a lot, though, and, and I think, um, and it's quite risky, which is why people are very nervous about it. They're nervous about being in change because they feel out of control and they feel that their future maybe is, is um, under question. I find people very loath to lead change. It's, it's the most exciting thing that you can do, but an awful lot of people run a mile. They go, oh, yes, please, I'd like to be on that project. Oh, yes, please, I'd like to lead that project. But I've seen a lot of people just lack the, the balls, if you'd excuse me saying that, to just go for it and make it happen. 
because they think it's very complicated and because they think that it's fraught with danger. And then you get all the horrible politics and you get, you know, the uh, business user telling the IT person that they're at risk and the systems are rubbish and, you know, and the IT person saying, well, you know, it's not my decision, it's you've got to sign off this set of user requirements or whatever. And you just get locked into that inertia of... Uh, but it fundamentally, at the heart of it, it people are just fearful of failing. So you see lots of typical patterns, don't you? You know, the systems were the thing that went wrong. It was the technology that was wrong. Technology is rarely the wrong thing. Technology is just technology, and you know, usually you have the odd glitch, but it's infinitely fixable. The thing that goes wrong is people don't ever use it, or people don't understand what they've got, or people don't exploit the opportunity, or they get locked in politics, and it just drags on forever and costs a fortune. Um, you know, people say with M&A, you know, we didn't do good diligence. Um, you know, we're in a, we've just come through a diligence process ourselves. Diligence is just lots of stupid data that people gather about things. And actually, you know, when you're selling a company, whilst, you know, you tell the truth, then clearly buyers often hear what they want to hear if they really want to buy. So I think that it's, an attitude, isn't it? It's about when M and A works well. It's because you see something that you can make something of if you put them together, and then it becomes an emotional thing, actually, and then an emotional thing to get the value that you want from it, not a me mechanistic thing. And then you can always blame the last guy that you took over from as being the idiot. But I, the reason the mirror is there is because I think when change goes wrong, there is only one place to look for the blame, and that's to yourself. If you've led the change and it's not delivered the goods, then I think you have to, as a leader, be prepared to look in the mirror and go, well, what is it that I didn't do? And as you see change not working in the process and you see things, mm, that looks a bit iffy, then start with that, look in the mirror and say, you know, what is it that I'm doing that's creating a culture in the team or that, it's, that there are blockages in the organisation? How can I then um, solve for those? I think the other um, reference that I would give, and this, this, this one amuses my colleagues, I think, hugely. When you look at sort of how leadership of change works, you've got a small amount in the mechanics of it. So that would be the, how you organise the team, you know, the governance structures, all of that good stuff that gets projects done or programmes of change done. Um, and I like that to be done, and I like that to be done early, and I like it to be done clearly, and then I like to ignore it. So um, everybody always says to me, oh, yeah, but you always get fixated about governance and you know, steering group meetings. And I say, no, I only get fixated about it because at a certain level, when you're trying to make change happen, you can't allow complete chaos. <coughs> but um, I really like them because it's in those forums that I really find out the truth of what's going on. Um, and I have my own informal governance, actually, too, usually the people who really tell me what's going on. And, it, and when you know about that and you know about the risks and you know about the things that are starting to go wrong, then it allows you to kind of flip to the other board, which is all the dynamic stuff, which is, you know, people not getting on or, um, you know, people being difficult or people not doing their job or whatever. Mm. And as a leader, your job in corralling all of that has no form. It is chaotic by its nature. Mm. Um, and so I always have felt, for me personally, because I'm, everybody thinks I'm sort of only retentive when it comes to project stuff, um, and I actually find it very boring. But I really like to know that it's there, as a sort of my safety net. Um, but I think that most of my time, ninety odd percent of my time, is over doing stuff that's not that structured, in just getting you know this person and that person together. And from a leadership point of view, sorry, the key point is how much of your leadership development do you spend on those kinds of leadership skills? You, you don't really, I think. And, you know, you kind of learn that by experience. It's not a training that you can have. I'm a big fan of coaching and mentoring, actually, and I'm a big fan of external coaches for people um, because I think you can just bring a completely different perspective to people and you can be that mirror to a leader, you know, as a, an external coach, your coach can tell you things you would never, ever, ever take from anybody else. And I know, so I've had a few coaches in my time. But 
hopefully the theme of people has resonated with you because, as I say, technology is just technology. The thing that will make a strategy happen or a change happen is people and how people work. So, you know, you can have a very average strategy and you can do it brilliantly and you will be a winner, a winner or you can have a very, you know, um, brilliant strategy that is just badly executed and sticks in somebody's head rather than happen. Um, and it's all about people. So as a leader, it's not so much what you do, it's how you do it that I fundamentally believe is, is, the, is the, the key thing. Um, and, um, you know, if you had one theme from me coming out of today, it would be actually it's culture that matters most in a team, in a function, in an organisation, in a big corporate, whatever that is, in a small startup, you know, it's the, the body of work that has to get done and the people that are doing that work. The culture that you shape as a leader, and that's very much about the shadow you cast in that culture, will give you the biggest chance of success more than any, any other thing. Um, and that's yours. And so I don't particularly want to dwell on these. These were just several years ago as we start on that cultural journey. We spent a lot of time as an organization talking about why do we exist? What do we want to achieve? You know, how will we get there? And it sounds quite trite when you see it on a chart and it's irrelevant to anybody in the room. Um, but I think the process we went through um, very formally and very you know, for quite a long period of time, actually thinking about that served as well because you were then we were then able to talk about well, what do we really want people to do and how do we want them to be and how do we want them to behave, and we could be very explicit as leaders in the way that we shadowed our behaviour. The hardest thing with that is the um, the leadership journey on that. You've got to you can say all those words and they're very easy to say. If you don't live it every day, people look at you and go, yeah, right, load of rubbish. And they don't go with you on that journey. So um, I think I included them literally as, as illustrative things. I think developing a culture of your team, developing a culture of your um, organization is critical when you're in a, any period, but particularly a period of change. So parts one and two of my igloo journey, I have got three things that I would leave you with. Um, you've got to have ambition and you've got to have hairy goals, audacious goals and all that good stuff. It's where you start from. You know, even any change needs to have a level of dream and um, vision about it. And you need to be really clear and passionate about that when you talk to people. People want to hear that, actually. They want to feel the wow factor of that. Um, and when you've planted your flag and you go for it, be bold. And again, most people, if they're led in that way, will do amazing things. They will work very, very hard. They will love their life. They'll do work at midnight. They'll happily kind of get a different rhythm of work if what they see you wanting them to do is something they can believe in. You know, detail planning we talked about, you will all get that. You've got to have it. You've got to have a sort of a bedrock of that. And you've got to give people staging posts. You know, you can't say in five years' time, you know, we're going to be like this. People are just like, oh, it's too long away, and they get bored. You know, in the next, in five years' time, we want to be here, and in six months, I want to have done that. And this is what we'll be able to do in six months' time. It's very different and much more energizing for people. So give people the kind of short uh, staging posts. But also, as a leader, those staging posts aren't just about energy. It's also about how you take a breath and look around you and go, what's happened to my world now? And how do I adjust maybe what I thought I was going to be doing in stage two or five to reflect that? Um, and always learn. You know, nobody's ever right. Even though you might pretend you've got a plan for five years, you will have to reapply your learnings. And I think finally, and the most important, is that point of you've got to create a journey for everybody. Some people will have to leave an organization. Some people will have to be exited from an organization or they'll leave themselves because they won't fit with the future and they can't adapt. A lot of people, though, and I think this is possibly, I, I, I think it's true of younger people, but I think it's true of all people, actually. If they believe in it, they'll want to change. And so if you can give them, a, them an emotional connection, then they'll go with you. 
Um, and in order to give people an emotional connection as a leader, you have to have humanity, you have to have humility, you don't know everything at all. And actually people quite like it when you admit that. Um, and that allows you, I think, to be quite unreasonable. So if you say to people, <laughs> I really would like this done, and they will go, no, you can possibly do that. Having the humanity to accept, I know it's difficult, I don't know how to do it either, but I'm sure we can kind of figure it out between us, gets you a long way, in my experience anyway. So that's um, my very short, hopefully not too long uh, and not too boring, igloo story, and I um, hope you found some wisdom in it anyway. Thank you. Thank you.